It's taken years to get Ram Mahalingam up to this podium. Um, and I, I've known Ram a long time. I can't say we're close friends. I don't, I don't know him that well. But I've always admired you and thought I knew you. And today, in one of the jobs of the directors to introduce our visiting speakers, um, I learned so much about you. And it's such a distinguished career that I want to actually say a bit about it at length. So bear with me, um, if you will, for a moment. Ram's one of us, as it were. Ram is a professor here at the University of Michigan. Um, he started off at the Anamalai University near Chidambaram in Tamil Nadu, where he got a B.Ed., I believe, Bachelor's of Education? Bachelor of Engineering. Bachelor of Engineering, that's what the E stands for. <laughs> which makes sense, because he was trained originally not as a, a psychologist, which he is now, but as a, as a civil engineer. Um, after that, he was a math tutor, a film script writer, a children's theater activist, poet, writer, lecturer, also a night watchman, a dishwasher and a cook, a book stacker, and I'd like to hear more about that someday, and a preschool teacher. He's had lots of different jobs, like perhaps many of us in this room, on this long and winding route to becoming a, a very preeminent psychologist. Ram did his... Uh, master's and PhD um, at the University in Pittsburgh, uh, completing his dissertation in 1998. Um, he, as I mentioned, he's a professor of psychology in the Personality and Social Context Program here at the University of Michigan. He's also a core faculty member of the Joint Psychology Women's Studies PhD program, offers courses in the School of Education as well, or cross-lists his courses there. He's the, uh, he was the director of the Honors Program in Psychology, which is the largest one in the country. Not a small task, and I think he did that as a junior faculty member, probably. Um, he's the founding director for the Accelerated Master's Degree Program in Psychology, and he's currently the director for the Barger Leadership Institute, which is described as a student-powered, faculty-guided community dedicated to developing leadership learning through engaged liberal arts education. It's a big deal, and he has lots of staff and maybe hundreds of student members. I never heard about it. And it's right here on this campus, and I looked them up. It's cool, go look at it. They, they have what they call habits that they want to inculcate in, in student leaders, and this may be your colleague from there. He's the one oh, you're the founder of it. Well, welcome, Mr. Berger, we're glad to have you. Um, so, I know I'm going on and on, um, but I want to. <laughs> it's the first talk, so let me do that. Um, Scholm's, Ram's uh, scholarship is, um, is well regarded, um, well established. He's received uh, numerous awards for his scholarship, for his pedagogy, and for his service. <laughs> In 2008, for example, he received the Otto Kleinberg Award from the Society of Psychological Study of Social Issues for a paper that he wrote. In 2009, the Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring Award for his contributions to pedagogy and social justice research. 2010, the Florence Denmark and Mary Reuter Award for Outstanding International Contributions to the Psychology of Women and Gender from the American Psychology, Psychological Association. He won both the 1923, Class of 1923 Teaching Award, uh, which is something that the College of LSA gives to faculty being promoted from junior to senior ranks, and most recently the John Dewey Award for Excellence in Teaching, also given by LSA um, for people when they're being promoted to full professor, which Ram recently was. 2011, Ram was elected by his peers as a fellow of the American Psych Psychological Association and I could go on and on. Ram's uh, research focuses on the cultural psychology of caste, immigration, and gender. He's an internationally respected scholar in the psychology of intersectionality, or the study of the interplay between race, gender, culture, power, and privilege. As one anonymous reviewer at Ram's promotion to full professor wrote, and I'm quoting, Ram is, in essence, a scholar's scholar, 
integrating the methods and theoretical orientations of multiple disciplines from philosophy, anthropology, sociology, and psychology, and producing extraordinarily powerful empirical work. He gets us to think and see the world in new ways. His work on culture, context, power, and privilege is perhaps the most sophisticated and important in the field of developmental psychology. All of that, and, and the thing that I most knew about Ram before I did all this research is how much extraordinary care and creativity he takes with students, both graduate and undergraduate students. He took a group of female African-American students to India a few years back to see what kinds of multiple um, you know, experiences of being in a marginal community were like in that context. Um, he's, he's an incredibly dedicated teacher. I think anyone who's studied under him, that's the first thing they'd want you to know. So, Ram's talk to this evening is on decasticization, dirty work, and dignity, a case study of Arun Tatiars in Tamil Nadu, and um, he'll tell us more about that when he gets up here. So please welcome, help me welcoming. Um, Thank you, I feel like you are talking about somebody else, so when you, and also you realize you're old. Um, <laughs> two things. Um, a talk so long it just burned out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe I get something when I lift all the glass yeah. Okay, all right, good. Thank you uh, for coming on a, Friday evening, there are a lot of other things to do. Um, to talk about my work, uh, what we call in psychology, dirty work within GOATS. Um, this came out of, um, it's a very accidental project, as many of my projects have been. Um, I used to work very late when I was a junior faculty, and I, I used to be friends with all the janitors in my building. <clears throat> then they, re, they were talking about, we used to, the shift starts at 4 p.m. here. They work till 12 a.m. That's a regular shift. That's the worst shift in the world for janitors, based on my study. Um, so I have another grad student whose grandfather was a janitor. So we were talking about doing a project on janitors. That's how we started, so we've been talking to them. Then that led to the uh, bigger project. So <clears throat> I want to give you a general introduction to the um, con context of this work. I'm going to focus on my work in India. It's a three country project. We actually studied uh, janitors. Um, janitors in India, South Korea, and the US. Um, I'm particularly going to talk about Arundhati years uh, from Chennai, Tamil Nadu, where I'm from. Uh, we're using Chennai floods as a case study to talk about these issues. Then I'm going to give some summary of main findings and also give a quick summary of how the sites look so that you have a sense of what it is. Because that will be, it'll be a long talk. We'll be sitting all night thinking about the three sites. OK, um, so I think the first question we were interested in is um, it's primarily the uh, research is geared towards organizational psychologists and organizational studies. But we draw um, freely from sociology, who have done a lot of work on labor sociology. Um, and women's studies <clears throat> and intersectionality, so uh, gender and work, all those things were very much informed our work, as you can see in the talk. First question was, we want to give a general picture about, this is uh, what across three sites we heard. So we just created a set of tools, what people talked about. We asked janitors, what do you think people about your work is? This is what they said. People, are, it's, people don't pay attention to them, they're invisible, um, they don't talk to them, people ignore them, people don't make eye contacts. They're invisible. Um, they are also lack of appreciation. Um, they are not noticed when entering a room. Um, you say good morning and they look right through you. So basically they were saying how, how much um, they are invisible in work. It's very ubiquitous. So this is one topic you can study any place. It's really all over the place. Um, it's also very dangerous. When I talked to the janitor's first interview, they told me after 9-11 we were joking how, how many times I was stopped in the airport. They said, you know, all the chemicals we have, we can actually make a bomb. We have all the chemicals here. We actually, we can actually, we can do dangerous things if you really want. So it's very, um, it's dangerous in many ways. One is the number of chemicals. They had to go through a lot of training. Um, the other thing is, um, 
women work in the night late, so it's a very dangerous job sometimes, depending on which context you're working. It's also solitary. Most of the time, they are uh, working alone, depending on what kind of uh, sanitation um, the policy is, planning is. Um, it's also invisible. People don't notice them until something is wrong. Only when, the, when things are not right, we actually talk to them. And because <clears throat> in the US context, at least UFM, we studied, since they work from 4 to 12, that means it's very difficult to integrate them to any activities of the department. Suppose if I'm doing a staff event at psychology, usually we finish it before 5. That means these people cannot participate in this. So it's very interesting how institutional practices also prevent us forming communities. Right? Um, it's also stigmatized because it's seen as dirty work. Um, so um, people notice things. Uh, it's also thankless. People only talk to us when things are not going well. OK, this is a sort of broader context of the work. So what I'm going to talk about is what are the theoretical lens I'm going to use, um, how my work has been informed by this. So there is some uh, body of work within the organizational studies called dirty work. They study uh, janitors, street cleaners, sanitation workers, butchers. This is a body of work. And they look at social marginality and dirty work. And we also use the intersectionality framework to really look at why we studied, how we want to look at our own work, with a specific focus on dignity in workplace. So interestingly, psychologists don't have much to say about dignity. So we study self-esteem, which is we are known for. But dignity, we have to go to sociology and anthropology, um, and our human rights, our philosophers. right? So then they, we also looked at invisibility, how invisible they are, because the invisibility came again and again in our uh, data. So we thought we should theorize invisibility. When specifically go to the Tamil Nadu context, we look at the corporate responsibility because the, the flood, how it led to the cleaning, and how um, these janitors were treated in, in Chennai. That's really the, so it made us to really look at those things and how Janitors also told their stories, how they really create a community to talk about, document their own suffering, right? So the talk is going to be really looking at different lenses, how the story has been told. Um, so dirty work is, uh, refers to, within psychology, it refers to occupations that are stigmatized as dirty or polluted. A um, lot of this work looking at, um, uh, for example, Simpson Slots, they study butchers in England, uh, how people do uh, work that is considered polluted, so by association, you become polluted. That's really the sort of association. How that affects the representations. Whole body of work look at tainted representations, uh, stigma, stigma associated with a particular identity. Right? Uh, for example, some identities are very useful to you. <clears throat> so if I study romance, so people think by association I'm a romantic person. But if I study uh, boredom, so I may, they, people may think I'm a boring person because by association they really think this is the kind of work you do because that's the kind of person you are. So the dirty work researchers, whenever we go to conferences, we always talk to each other because people, how our colleagues talk about us, right? Why we are studying dirty work, right? So this is really, so we have a small community. We actually talk to each other a lot. Um, the larger context of research, each lens, each site has the specific issues we came up with or specific issues we are focusing on. In the US context, we look at the neoliberal policy of uh, how to optimize workplace. YS1 is the new program they, they in implemented in the US, in the U of M campus, so we studied that. In South Korea, we looked at uh, gender and aging, how middle-aged women, typically 80 to 90% of janitors in South Korea are women, and middle-aged women. So we looked at how these uh, intersections of gender, class, and age affect their work, how they see themselves, the role of all women unions in, in sort of restoring the dignity. When it comes to India, we have the shining India new policy that everything is fine, neoliberal. So one of the common thing is how neoliberalism affected each of these states. So I'm going to focus only on the Indian context. I'll be happy to ask you, respond to questions if you have anything. I'm going to have one slide summarizing the main points from three sides, so you at least get a sense what it is. Um, so the question of dignity, of course, We draw dignity also, we draw dignity research in the workplace, dignity play research, and also look at Ambedkar and the other uh, Dalit activist work. Okay. Um, the situated intersectionality, that's the first uh, framework we used. Uh, that's Yuval Davis' work. She talks about belonging because belonging, sense of belonging is one of the recurring themes in our work, all places, because they belong to a group because they are doing the dirty work, but at the same time, the community they are serving don't feel them as part of the community. And that's a recurring theme. 
different ways it appeared in the US context, it happened in a different way <clears throat> in South Korea, and of course in India it's the worst, so I can think of a sense of belonging. Um, so the, as researchers, what are our responsibilities? So that's the first question we asked ourselves. Uh, I will introduce my team a little later. So we want to, so you all Davis talk about how we can have a self-reflective social positioning, awareness of who we are, root our identity, and use that identity, have a situated gaze that helps to us to shift our gazes that is productive. It also create self us, help us to create a transversal dialogue where we can have a common epistemology of solidarity even though we come from different social positions. How the different social positions help us to connect and across borders and boundaries. So this is the spirit of our research, the kind of uh, epistemological commitment, methodological commitment we had to our research. So she really pushed us to really think about the expansion of the feminist epistemology from being situated, knowledge to situated imagination, what the suffering is. Although we cannot speak for them, we try to be in that position to really talk about, document their life. So that's really the sort of a goal of this. <clears throat> one of the epistemological, um, you know, one of the commitments we have in, in doing this kind of work. So a major work uh, for us in Dignity, the work is uh, Bessworth Wilson, who was here in the fall, last fall, right? He was the opening speaker for the last fall. So he really um, literally liberated about 100,000 manual scavengers, and he's been doing work. So his work was very inspiring. He was also one of the participants we interviewed for our project, so when we did this work. So while the uh, uh, Chennai floods were going on, Bhim Yatra was also started, they were actually going through Chennai after that. So <clears throat> she had a lot of first-hand information about it. So um, in the dignity literature, uh, it's mostly sociologists and a lot of work. Psychologists don't have a lot to say about this topic. Um, Rodney Hudson, who's a labor sociologist, talked about dignity in mistreatment work. Um, Sharon Bolton talks about dignity in workplace, how to conceptualize it. I will walk through it a little bit. And Martin Luther King wrote the last, Every Labor Has Dignity. That was his last lecture he gave because he was, um, because he was assassinated the last night he was fighting. He was uh, talking about the Memphis uh, state sanitation worker strike. That was the last talk. That was the last uh, lecture he gave. Dignity in class, Michelle Lamont's work talking about boundary maintenance and labor and how um, the janitors in Europe, in, in Paris and the US, talk about maintaining the dignity uh, and the boundary, or when they cross the boundary. Um, Karen Lucas studied dignity injuries. So these are the research informed our own understanding. Um, for Rodney Hudson, four factors that diminish dignity in workplace. For him, mismanagement of abuse, overwork, limits on autonomy, contradictions of employee involvement. So basically, all those things are signs of a lot of dignity injuries happening in workplace, so which is not a good sign. Um, Sharon Bolton really talks about dignity in work, and she distinguished between dignity in work and dignity at work. In dignity in work, she talks about how the work itself has certain respectable occupation, the kind of work you do. Dignity at work is have a, a workplace that is equitable, safe, and respectful, and healthy working conditions. For the janitor's project we did, we didn't find either they have dignity in work, the way they were treated, or they have dignity at work either. So that's what the main thing we found consistently. Dignity injuries are also com how these people uh, face indignities in the workplace, how they reproduce certain regimes of inequalities, right? So these um, researchers looked at how particular cultural context as well as organizational practices can re perpetuate equal inequalities and also can naturalize certain dignity injuries, right? So Morales work, that's what uh, we start from here. So this is the opening line of the paper, urban life means your shit is not your problem. I'm going to use the language because she typically uses the language to talk about. Basically what happens when you don't see something, that means people don't pay attention to this. Especially in Chennai, um, urban people don't really think about the cleaning because it is censored at some other people's problem. So public expectations of sanitation in urban settings, that means if you are, because, um, you don't see it, that means you don't, you're not responsible for it. So if you really look at the, what we call the urban sanitation imagery, the way you assume, or if I have to use a psychology, psychological term, they're using anthropological term, psychological term, it is a representation of sanitation. What do you think sanitation is? Your, your lay theories of sanitation. An urban uh, person thinks sanitation is something other people's problem. So when you flush the toilet, your job ends there. Somebody else has to take care of it. So how that leads to certain disconnect between what happens. So she did a study in um, 
Buenos Aires in Argentina, how urban people think about sanitation system. That was the main work. So the, uh, the uh, imaginaries have four aspects. One is urban citizen does not engage physically or mentally with their shit or its management. Basically, you don't touch it, you don't do it. It's an appropriate urban sanitation system requires flushing. That means you don't have direct contact. System that requires users' engagement with their shit and its management <coughs> signify rural undeveloped. So if you touch it, that means you are rural underdeveloped. So the urban people think that it is not their job to do it. It's also the responsibility of the state. So this system, how with this mentality, that means they can disconnect with the labor and, and they don't give the dignity that deserves for the labor. That's sort of the main argument she was making. So what we did was we tried to see how it works in this particular. OK, other years, um, they are the janitors in Primarily, that's the Dalit caste group in my state. They primarily do all the uh, sanitation work. About 90% of the janitors, 90, 95% would be from this caste group. Um, <clears throat> almost all sanitation work all over India is done by mostly Dalits. So we looked at, these are the general questions, we looked at it. How do intersections of class, caste, gender, job status shape the dignity of janitors in India? So with a specific context in Chennai. What are the ways in which mnemonic communities preserve the memories of these sufferings and corporate responsibility? So corporate responsibility means when the, when the state is not doing its job, somebody has to do, somebody else is doing the job, what we call the mnemonic communities, <clears throat> how the suffering of these people have been documented by the group. What are the ways the people also resist? There is also resistance from the janitor. They don't just sit back and take this right. So as Hutton identified, five, the invisibility has five features. They're physically out of sight, ignored or overlooked, they're marginalized, economically or culturally devalued, or legally unprotected, unregulated. So we find features of all of this in the experience of janitors during the suffering, right? So Shining India is a project, new liberal project, our prime minister launched. He says it's a country is going to have, uh, everything will be completely automized, we have a technology will solve the problem. That's the kind of a big thing, right? So whereas people like Ambedkar really talked about, uh, in order to really, if you are going to fight the caste, we need to really talk about radical friendship, where you talk about connect to other people as a human being with, a dignity, with dignity, where equality, liberty, and fraternity will be the guiding principles of connection between humans. Right? So basically, it's a process of reconstituting social relations, not based on birth or caste, but based on human, humanized civility and respect. Basically. You give dignity to the other person. So you're going to connect to the other person across transcending the caste or the other, any birth-based identity you have, right? A commitment to transform social relations or to demand the caste to protect the dignity of Dalits. So basically, we need to really change the social relationships. That's what basically was what we found in our work too. So for Ambedkar, friendship is based on a radical practice. So recognition of militant forms of oppression with civility and solidarity, right? So we found Constantly, all these things were violated, the way how the janitors were being treated in Chennai. The dehumanization is the common practice, common things. There are different ways it's happened over time. So Chennai witnessed the uh, flood in 2015, so which resulted in the vast damage and public-private properties. Um, so if you look at newspaper readings, a lot of coverage how Shining India is, all the volunteers, middle class is, helping and they're really, uh, they work very hard to bring the city back. Newspaper, social media coverage, extol people reaching and how middle class is so helpful to each other. That's really the common narrative. So we were looking at it when the water receded, the city has, be, has to be cleaned. That's where the shit happens and all the shit starts there. That's what the problem is. So we started our research at that point because we've been following the other one. When it comes to cleaning, no middle class participants want to do the cleaning. So they have to go outside the city, go to all the districts. They really marshal so many people, all the other years they can find from any neighboring districts, brought them to the city to clean the city. They were working for long hours in unsafe conditions to clean the city. Within a week, they actually brought the city back, which is an amazing work they did. Um, Okay, so what we did was, okay, this is what the study is. So we did, what we did was we actually looked at all the newspapers, social media coverage, YouTube, whatever we can do. So we also interviewed 15 janitors. We also interviewed journalists who wrote about this and two academics, three Dalit activists. And we also quoted all the readers' responses to these articles, how people actually responded to this 
whenever there is an article about ja Dalits, what they did. So um, the Dalit janitors worked very hard to bring, the, but they were mistreated. Few died in the process of working, at least two or three deaths. They didn't confirm beyond that. Um, the sufferings of the janitors were mostly covered by the social media by Dalit activists. Nobody really write, wrote about them except the Dalit activists to only document about this. Whereas there's a lot of photos about middle class people helping each other, they distribute the food, all those things, right? Okay, um, what are the main findings? What we found was Dalits were required to work in any human conditions for long hours. There is, um, they were brought in, they worked about 12 to 14, 16 hour shift they worked. Um, they, were, they were actually asked to stay in a school. They were not even given a room. They were brought in a lorry, brought them about 200 miles, they drove them overnight to come and clean the city. Because nobody from the city middle class wants to do the cleaning, right? Then they also found the infantilization of uh, and micromanagement of Dalit workers. They were, they were on a schedule. They're really closely monitored, right? Very heavily monitored. They really treated like kids. That's what they said in the interviews. Um, they were not given any proper safety gears. Many of them did not have any, any rubber boots or gloves. And they were asked to clean the city. So I'm going to give some quotes about what the, what the Dalit voices look like. Then we'll go through each one of this data set, how it looks. Um, they reveal how disaster management practices perpetuate mistreatment and how they don't really talk about us. We are not in the disaster management planning at all. They don't talk about cleaning. They only talk about distribution of uh, um, food and medicine. That's what the main the disaster management plan is. Um, they also talked about um, work-family conflict, how they worked long hours. When they go home, they didn't have time to talk to them. They were feeling uh, nausea, all those, how it affects the health and they drank a lot during the time. They really drink quite a bit. 80% of the men drank during the cleaning. So the alcoholism is pretty heavy in this particular community. We worked hard to have, to have the city back. We washed the house 15, 20 times to remove the smell. We were efficient. We learned from mistakes and we supported each other. This is one of the most difficult job and paid the least. I worked hard dealing with the most disgusting things and live on tea for two weeks. I didn't have time to go and see my family. Basically, this is the most common responses. Uh, my hands were injured while clearing broken glasses. When my wife and children saw that, they were crying. Although I suffered physically and mentally, I survived mosquito bites and worked nonstop. Who cares about us? Nobody cares even, even when we die, even if we die. Um, I have seen my relatives getting injured and sick. A drain had been clogged. My uncle had to enter the drain. He must have inhaled some poisonous gases inside the drain. He became unconscious. We were worried. A cousin of mine went inside the drain to bring him out. If he had delayed even slightly further, my uncle may have died. Even after the floods, we have to deal with so much waste. We are cleaning waste with our bare hands throughout the day. Even if we are not well, we have to continue working. There is no time for rest. Nobody cares. So this is the common response. So this is kind of a summarized most of the most common themes we found. So basically, um, they were not given proper food. Uh, they were not given proper soap even to wash themselves. And that means many people didn't eat because they don't want to eat uh, without washing their hands. So what happens was then these people were not visible in any of the media. So we were looking at who are the people talking about these people. The corporate re irresponsibility. Before I go, do you have any questions about um, our interviews, anything at this point? I'm going to move to the Dalit activist documentation of their lives or suffering. Yes? Uh, homes, and depending on where they are. The city, they have to clean the city, but sometimes people also have to go and clean the house because the flood, house was flooded completely. Um, the, uh, most of the times, the, the city, the Meadows Corporation uh, hired them. Uh, sometimes if you're going to clean the house, if you spend more time in the house, then the house owners give them some money, 100 or 200 rupees. Uh, it's, that was the personal arrangement between them. But they were primarily cleaning the whole city, so getting everything, cleaning all the dead bodies and rats and all those things. Um, corporate responsibility uh, refers to events where um, organizational actions, uh, actions can affect people, different stakeholders. So whenever corporations talk about these questions, uh, they actually um, try to, over time, try to erase the memory. They basically use the passive voice, oh, over time you don't even document, these are the corporate uh, things we did that affected different stakeholders in our um, in our uh, company or organization. 
So people who study organizations always look at how corporations erase these memories over time. Right? Madras Corporation don't have any record of what happened to Dalits at all, except what is written in the, uh, in the, in the newspaper. So um, what Dalit intellectuals did was they started documenting this in social media, newspaper, or the newspaper column. So they became the mnemonic communities. They really document what happened to them, how they were mistreated, and how, are they, uh, how they treated the workers, and also not only Dalits, other progressive work groups like union activists also start talking about them. So these are the four things they did. One is raising awareness of the mistreatment. Basically, there's only documentation how these people were treated. These are the uh, activists in, in Facebook, YouTube. You can see all kind of discussion about this, what happened to them. They also went on TV, raising awareness about these issues. Documenting dignity injuries in the social media. They really wrote about what happened to them. Take, pic take pictures. It's a pretty active um, community. Um, they also challenged the social amnesia of Dalit laborers in disaster memories. It's not, it's not the first time it's happening. They also documented how it's been a recurring theme in Indian disaster management. Highlighting the grief and emotions in the exploitation of Dalit labor. So they really went and interviewed people. They really talked to them. These are the only people really record voices of Dalit voices in the public narrative memory. In 1999, following a devastating cyclone of Orissa, 200,000 animal carcasses were left flying, lying in the open. The government officials approached locals to remove these carcasses for higher pay. Villager responded, I have some self-respect left. The officials flew 200 super cast members from New Delhi for the work. He says, Ravichandran Batran, who wrote this, he's the first Arundhati got a PhD in English. He is an English scholar, but he's an activist. He writes in all the English newspapers about Arundhati. So we interviewed him. He says, it's not the first time happening. See, in Tamil Nadu, they're bringing from other states. From other states, they bring from other states. So it's really a common theme. So this is the first time people are writing about it. So it's been happening. Is, is our humanity castless? Um, this is the description of one of the candidates who went through this. Rama described how he was woken up at 4 a.m. in the morning and brought to Chennai. Basically, this is how they, they collected people from neighboring districts. They never told us anything. All of a sudden, they knocked in our doors and brought us here. They said, we will have to do some work, like sweeping. But garbage, which is like mountain, they make us collect with our bare hands, put it in our head, and dispose it. I swear that is becoming impossible. Two times I became unconscious and fainted. This is the most common. A lot of them got sick. And many of them don't have access to the private medical hospitals, so they have to go to uh, um, government hospital. We had to go to the government hospital. You need to go and get a token before 11 o'clock to get to scene that day. So, so it's really very complicated how they didn't have time to go and get the token because they don't have any insurance, all those things. So we also looked at how people responded to these Dalit activist writings. So we looked at readers who were responding to these articles. So we found about 42 responses in English. So we mostly English newspapers, that's what we could find. So there are four categories of responses. One is saying, oh my gosh, we need to improve our technology. There is a technological problem. We should improve the technology and professionalization of janitors. Once you professionalize everybody, things should be fine. There should not be a problem. Second response was, oh, this is really bad. There is, uh, we should call for a systemic change. There is corruption in the corporation. It's a whole middle class obsession with corruption, right? There is a corruption in the, in, in the, in the, in the um, corporation. As long as we can get rid of corruption and politicians, um, corrupt politicians, we can change the system. They really talk about the system. They never talked about the specific suffering these people are going through. Third call, really look at uh, a blank. You should have a caste blind approach. Don't bring caste into this problem. Specific word is, this news is another conniving attack to communalize and casteize the society. In the rain, many people suffered. Why one has to pin it on Dalits? This shows how the journalists don't want peace in the country. Basically, by bringing it up, you're really creating a problem. So it's not a, just a caste issue. It is a general problem everybody is going through why you're going to just blame Dalits alone, which is not fair. Of course, the last one is, oh, this whole thing is their problem. It's not a problem. Janitors should take responsibility. If you really shape up, you can do it. Why don't you go and do it? Who is shopping, stopping you? You can join Dalits and help them instead of showing false sympathy here. Somebody has to clean the shit. It's not as if they are looking at caste certificate before appointing people to these jobs. They do. Many castes really look at whether you have, it's reserved for them. Dalits are welcome to get education and use reservation and get good jobs. 
if they choose to clean shit, they can do so, they can do so too. So basically, here your problem is your problem. If you're really smart, you won't have to do this. So if you're taking it, you should do this. Don't complain about this. There's no issue about really the, the right. But at the same time, we also found the workers also talked about um, how this experience also um, affected them. But it's also there is uh, there is not that there is no evidence of them resisting. How they also show agency, how they actually restore their dignity. What are the ways they talked about um, restoring dignity? Because they also found um, the whole approach to them. For the first time, somebody called me sir. One person said in the interview, for the first time in my life, somebody called me sir. So they never did it before the flood. When I was cleaning the house, they really were nice to me. So they really have what we call the uh, narrative repair. So you really construct a story where they can talk about how um, how they restore their agency, their sense of self, who, um, how to have some pride in what they do. Um, they say how, for the first time, someone called me sir. How people really work very hard, people really respond to them, somebody gave them food. Um, they also talk about uh, how the flood also leveled, a, the, it's a democratizing problem. It is affecting the rich and poor. So I get to, get, for the first time I get to the rich man's house, I clean them, the shit was floating all over the place, I was cleaning it. So it's, it's so sad because we lived with it, but for the first time seeing these people going through, I feel sorry for them. They kind of reverse the gaze in a way, um, how to talk about this. Unions tried very hard to help them because unions really fought for them, getting medication, things like that. So unions play a very important role, they talk about union. They also talked about um, the reverse infantilization, how these people are helpless. They really use a very parental, uh, how these people, when everything is going wrong, how these people actually are helpless. We only help them to bring the city back. Um, they also talked about how these people don't have common sense. In Tamil, Padichalna Arivillasa, that means they are educated people, they don't have common sense, right? And they don't know, although they are educated, they are not smart, knowledgeable, they lack common sense. So then they also said, why they treat me like this? That is, it's your dirt, I'm cleaning your dirt. Don't think me as polluted. I'm the one clean, I'm cleaning your dirt, it's not my dirt. So why do you treat me like a dirt, right? So they really, very powerfully, she was talking about how, how these people are talking about it is their uh, dirt. And some, one person said, they're only clean outside, not inside, sir. Right, they said they're only clean inside, outside. They don't really look at this question, so. Um, they also use a lot of we language um, in the emotional management literature they talk about. So when you don't have a sense of belonging, you always use the we language. So in Tamil, Nanga sir, they'll say Nanga, even though she's the only person talking to me. She switched to we, in almost all the interviews, they all saw, talked about their sense of belonging, how they use the we to construct an identity, even though only one person was talking at the time. It was not even a group interview. So, it, so of course, these are all very rhetorical ways they can, um, they can fight the system, but at the same time, the structural issues are still there, but they also have to work this way to really fight the problem. We also found within the generators there are two groups. One are the regular employees who are working for the city. Then there is a group who are, who are the contract workers. That's a new trend. So even in University of Michigan, the, the trend is the outsourcing the labor. So you work for a contractor. So we also looked at the people who work on the regular, and there is a lot of interesting um, difference across those uh, uh, class differences and the, um, how these people are treated. There's a differential pay. Basically, people who are full-time employees, they get more money. Um, so they, are, uh, they don't get the, what we call the risk outsourcing. Whenever there's a difficult job, they gave it to the contract workers. So within the community, there is a janitors, they really have a different way of looking at this. Um, there's also different spheres of dignity injuries, because certain jobs, they won't do it. They want the contract workers to do it. They won't help them. There is a certain amount of lack of solidarity. Then occupational health issues. Issues Basically, these people don't have any insurance. So there is a particular way contract workers are more disadvantaged than the regular workers who work for the corporation, who has more protection, more leave, all those things. So they really, there is some tension between the full-time workers and contract workers. The contract workers, so we do the same thing. We get only half the pay <clears throat> what the um, regular people are getting. So in the context of inequality, Butler talks about so injustice per, per, persist because um, these people are not uh, regarded as grievable. They are not grievable people. They don't deserve the grief. That means that leads to uh, a sense of loss associated with them, and we also don't really see them as um, 
so we don't deserve our grief in a sense because they are actually socially marginalized all the time, so we don't really engage with them. So for Butler, the undoing of injustice involves a discursive capacity to grieve and establish the poetics of grief as a shared belief. Sometimes it comes as a poem, sometimes it comes as a narrative, sometimes it comes as in their films. There are people working on documentaries looking at these sort of things, how to really bring the sense of uh, how their suffering is also is worthy of your attention, and that's what they're working on. The ungrievability of some subjects, how they're reproduced over time, the subordination of them also lead to the, um, may lead to the situation where their suffering is not even noticed. People don't pay attention to them. It's so naturalized. So they are hyper-visible as Dalits, but at the same, same time their suffering is invisible. So there is a lot of hyper-visibility of, of being a Dalit, doing this work, because you're wearing a uniform, they know right away you are, you are, the, <clears throat> you are, you are a cleaner because you wear the city uniform. Um, but at the same time, um, people don't pay attention to this suffering. So there is a particular way, there is a paradox of being hyper-visible, and they're also invisible, their suffering is invisible. So basically, institutional uh, practices they perpetuate because there is no grievance mechanism for them to go and talk about these issues. There is no cell like this in the corporation. No official from the corporation wants to talk to us. We tried several times. We want to talk to them. None of them want to talk to us. Um, so there's such a naturalization of caste and dirty work dehumanizes suffering. Basically, it makes this particular group more vulnerable to this uh, you know, dehumanization and the dignity injuries they experience over time. So, but at the same time, generators also resist infantilization of their labor in very culture-specific ways. Each, we found this tendency in each of these cultures in different ways. So intersections of caste, class, and dirty work, and social marginality, whether you are a regular worker or a contract worker, all those things affect the kind of, uh, how you're going to experience your work, the kind of indignities you're going to experience while doing this work. Um, so the uh, suffering of Arundhati years have been, within the Dalit community, there was also discussion about how we should look at this most marginalized group, how we should um, discuss this uh, suffering of this Arundhati years and how to bring it. People like Ravi Chandran is very forceful in bringing those uh, as an academic, and he also is very educated. Um, he has a PhD, and he's working as a scholar in um, Simla now, so he writes a lot about this uh, suffering. So. Wrong button. Okay. Okay. Um, so inequalities, the inequalities become um, make them ungri un ungrievable subject, and that leads to uh, the invisibility of their suffering. So it's kind of a uh, interlinked process. We try to understand how the interlinked process and how different communities help them to foreground it. The reproduction is also of social relation, also. Um, creates a culture of servitude. So people think that they're ready, they are there to serve them. That's a kind of an urban imaginary of a sanitation work. And that's one of the major problem in helping, in really raising awareness about them with the urban population, which we noticed it. So, so basically this is sort of a major focus of our work. So in the US context, we are looking at how the neoliberal policies of uh, the OIS one, which is uh, trying to, micromanage workers. For example, before um, YS1 was introduced, each floor have three janitors. They clean everything. They take care of it. Now, there'll be one janitor, he'll clean all the uh, mirrors in all, all floors. One janitor will do all the vacuuming. So they really micromanage their work and how it affects their work. That's what we looked at here. In South Korea, how it affects women uh, class. Class becomes an important issue. Uh, work family conflict is a big issue. Sandwich generation. Then in the context of India, it's untouchability, caste, hierarchy, invisibility of dignity injuries. There are different stressors. There are different modes of resistance in each context, right? So it's really, I'll be happy to talk with you if you have more questions. So these are our own positionalities. We are the people who are involved. Veronica is the faculty now. She is a Cuban American. Her father was a, her grandfather was a janitor. Ye Hyung, Chung, Ye Hyung Cho is from South Korea. She's a faculty in Highland College in Seattle. Both her parents have a PhD, but she's also studied social class. Srinath Jagannath, who was a collaborator with me, he teaches IM and Indoor and Pataraja. Um, he comes from a most backward community. Uh, Pataraja and Srinath have already studied workers in a crematorium. They've been studying dirty work for a long time. They did ethnography of that. 
So I've been studying, I'm a first generation college student from an OBC community. So this is one, my own positionality where I'm from. So we all have um, different background, but we all um, want to use our own um, experiences to understand, help, document. In a way, we are also the Nimani communities of these voices. So we finally, we got a paper accepted. Now this, these stories are out now in an in a academic journal, in a, in, a, in a business school journal. To be, it took two years for us to convince the editors to publish this paper. So thank you. I'll be happy to send the paper to any of you. So dignity matters in the workplace. So we are trying to theorize dignity based on from the bottom up, from the data, how to think about dignity in a culture-specific way, how different intersections play a role, what are the ways people restore, work to restore the dignity in these different contexts, how gender, class, religion, age, everything plays a role, so in ethnicity and race in the US context. right? So um, it's also important for organizational psychology. We don't talk much about dignity in our work, so we should pay more attention to this. And disaster management research doesn't talk anything about cleaning at all. So we went and looked at all the research on disaster management. Um, so we talked about how it's important to have a cleaning focus and who, are the, who do the cleaning. So most of the time, the marginalized group does the cleaning, right? Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to discuss and talk more about the data. It's fine, you can do that too, it's fine, no problem. Yeah. And we have a microphone, um, some people don't like to use the microphone, but it does help us uh, capture the conversation and the recording um, that people who aren't able to be here today will be able to hear online. So please use the microphone unless it's here. Somebody, somebody there? Right here, yeah, right. Right. Start here. <clears throat> One idea I've had as I've uh, uh, as I've eaten at the Michigan Union for years, I uh, told the janitors this idea to raise their own sense of dignity and importance in the work, suggesting that if the janitors went on strike for a week, it would shut down the university or lead to, it would cause such problems it would really interfere with the functioning because of the necessity of their work That's right. to make to keep things going. Now that my idea is to seek legislation in India that it be required in education in like grade school or high school to teach uh, to give them a consciousness of the importance of janitorial work, which would thus raise respect, knowing their necessity. Agree? It's a good point. Somebody. Oh. <laughs> okay, I see Minnie, you're next. Just a clarification mm -hmm. when you say corporation, you mean the municipal government? Uh, uh, corporation, not, not the corporate world. Okay, it's not a corporate. corporation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ram, and I really enjoyed your focus on dignity in thinking about this project. But um, the question I have is the way you think about Dalit and untouchability in talking about the Aaron Thakiris, because in some ways, the more interesting thing from Ambedkar here is precisely that graded inequality. That's right. Because the problem is that the other Dalits, other untouchables consider this work Correct. as the worst right. of the worst, right. Right? right? So I'm wondering whether that plays a role in the way you want to think about this as a question of caste, or is it a question of the dignity of certain kinds of occupation? I mean, it's difficult to untangle it in a way. It's important, you're right, because they go together here. And um, um, only comparative work we can do is we found in Gujarat, all the crematorium workers used to be Dalits. Now they don't do the work. It's done by Muslims, right? That's the work uh, Pataraja and uh, Jagannathan did the work uh, uh, with this. But they're, they're, then they have different kind of rituals to really uh, normalize their work, why there is dignity, they are really taking them to the next world, all kind of things they talk. It's very fascinating. Um, 
this this is a huge heated debate within the dalit uh, intellectual community in tamil nadu is it greater inequality we are talking about how other caste, other dalit caste groups look at them uh, people like ravichandran batran is very vocal about it so what are the intra group conflicts and how to think about it you are right i think this is really um, the question is but um, but they are very strongly uh, using ambedkar to really mobilize themselves they really uh, formed a union um they even called themselves the adi tamilar that is the first tamilar uh, first tamils uh, peravai with adi tamilar peravai they are the first tamil union and that's the party name <coughs> who really fight for this uh, for the rights and work place and that's true yeah the graded uh, inequality is, is a big issue and it's also hot topic in the state now because all the dalit parties are correct. by higher dalit caste correct 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 right right and nobody does this and uh, who are we and tamil nadu is the only state where there is a internal reservation for this community mm-hmm. and there is a mobility for them and now ravichandran is one example of that so we have a lot of examples of being going to medical school and engineering um, we have 3% reservation internal reservation for them so i have uh, two questions one sh- brief and the other one's a little longer. So the brief one is I'm just you mentioned several times that about force and coercion mm-hmm. used to sort of mm-hmm. to get them into and to organize their labor and I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that a bit. And then um I'm kind of struck by this. I'm trying to think about the the language and the symbols and the metaphors of dirty work that I was hearing here like so a, there was this confluence of filth and pollution but also shit Right. in the wake of the flooding and i'm wondering given this other kind of management of dirty work by dalits whether this the particular mix of filth pollution and shit in this case gave a particular dynamic to the visibility or invisibility or issues about dignity with regards to this work um i think the first let me there the first question but the first question we really had a whole section on the paper and how queers they were they were really literally brought in so in the name again the state demands you are doing the service for the state so they de- use the nationalist language to them and we have a lot of data on that but the reviewers want us to cut that part so that's why i didn't touch this in this paper here <laughs> because the reviewers that's too much you are doing we all talked about we call them mafia so how the state act like a mafia how we brought them how it coerced them we really documented detailed uh, ways how they forced them they said you are serving the nation so you are doing this work and some of them internalized it they also talked about we serve the nation they talked about the same language they used it and they are really literally they were sleeping they woke them up in the middle of the night put them in a lorry they're not even a bus they brought like a cattle so about 200 people in the lorry brought them here so that's really literally so that's what happened second question is this is particularly hard the magnitude with which they have to deal with pollute dirt shit all the dead bodies uh, cockroaches you know cats and rats and all kind of stuff that was very hard for them because they didn't even expect the magnitude they were not prepared the city does not have a plan they really throw them in and okay we are going to feed you every 7 or 8 hours we'll give you alcohol if you want and you're going to work so they worked about somewhere between 14 to 16 hour shift and that was the condition so we that was really like a coerced labor that's what we documented so whole section we had in the paper so we had to write a separate paper on that so that's what they said the reviewer said Thank you Ram. Um you talk to a number of different um people, communities, actors. I don't recall the municipal corporation being one of the groups that you document. They don't here. want to talk to us. So you, so you tried and We tried were several times. Okay. I used my all the all the office influence I could network okay. I have. We tried. <laughs> they said uh, there are so many things that are going on we don't want to talk about it right now so okay. maybe at some point we'll we'll get there okay fair enough thank you yeah. uh, that's a very historian's question so it's interesting so, so to, uh, <laughs> we want to get we, 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 we want to give them a chance so we really we want to be fair to them absolutely thanks for a great talk i was wondering so this was a terrific talk focused on a particular event and even in the present i wonder if you if it wasn't the focus of your research but could you speak to the question of how how the work has changed or so we talked about some caste groups are now the work is being taken by muslims and it's a huge topic but how has either actually the kinds of work and the treatment changed and also how has the 
self-reflection change? Would dignity be a term that would have been that people do you think would have would have used for, as a way of explaining what was going on with them 20, 30 years ago, or, or their new? Is it part of a new a new kind of democratic politics? Um, I think it's it's a good question. What we are doing is we are trying to address the question. So we our uh, the, the second project we are we just finished the interviews. We in, we are interviewing janitors in the malls in in Mumbai. So the new liberal projects, so we really followed them. There is a training program for them. There is a professionalization. They are given gloves. They have uniforms. It's very fascinating training they go through. That group is much more diverse than the janitors we saw in our state. So there are more urban immigrants, sorry, my immigrants from different, uh, migrants from different parts of the country. Um, they are a little more diverse, uh, but a lot of Dalits are there, but a more diverse group. Uh, more women work there. Um, so we are, we are interviewing them, and what we found was they were given half the pay what the uh, Mumbai municipal uh, sanitation worker will get, but they have dignity <laughs> in the way they talk about it that they mentioned because they have a uniform, they look extremely like a college uh, dorm cleaner if you see them in the mall. So we went and did a ethnography and we also interviewed them, how they got the job. Um, they were saying a very small thing, some people left um, working for the corporation uh, as temporary employees with the potential to become a full-time employee. But to come to the mall, they said, there is no place to change your clothes in the, uh, if you work for the, for the city. So you have to wear your uniform in the train all the way you take the train and come to the city. That means everybody knows you are a sanitation worker. Whereas if you work in the mall, there is a change room. So they can come. How there are small practices really preserve the dignity. And they really talked in detail in our interviews. Um, so I have a job there. The pay is equal, but I have a chance to become a permanent employee. But I'm leaving that to come to the mall to really have this sort of a, they don't have, they can dress like a regular person, come and change. So the, the, there is a neoliberal project, their subjectivity, they are creating it, which is very interesting, but they are also buying into it. So how the tra training system is there, they're given gloves, is all this, all the, they have their own closet, they can get access to the chemicals, um, all the leaning, uh, cleaning supplies, they have their own uh, inventory. So this is really, so in a way, uh, this new project, brings people from different, uh, it's become a class project now. It's a working class project rather than necessarily a caste project that would be. That's the story is coming up from the data. We haven't fully translated yet, so I don't have all the data to really present. Maybe next time. Thank, thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, I have a question about your sort of broader comparative project, and I am wondering, like, if there's any sort of difference in terms of like family dynamics works in in different sites. And I sort of got to think about that question as I like you know, read like one of your interview data, you know, talking about you know the uncle almost dying, and it made me realize that I mean, because of the fact that um, certain cast, cast like in, in that particular site was in charge of, has been in charge of uh, janitorial work, it is possible for the entire family maybe correct. to work That's in that correct. occupation, right. which would be very different from, for instance, the case of South Korea, right. where many like middle-aged women are working on the sort That's of janitorial right. job. So does that like affect the boundary maintenance or like modes of resistance that you're talking about, like in different sites? Um, the resistance have very different uh, forms. For example, um, South Korea, we find very fascinating how they use language and some cultural norms to really, so the people have to call them um, grandma, so the, the students have to address them. Then they use that language to leverage, to really tell them, oh, you're not eating well, so all of a sudden it become a grandparent relationship. There is no such space in India at all. There is no, they, they, if they work, the, the janitor will never have a conversation like that with a student or with any, any public. Whereas it was very possible. And within this we found um, janitors were very good in manipulating this to somebody who's trying. So we really say, I'm trying to be like her. She's very good, so we know her. We have actually seen her doing it. So that's the way how they really use this to really. And they're also extremely, um, um, good at uh, articulating different identities they have. They are talk about different uh, things they are interested in. They are interested in dancing, uh, their hobbies. So they have different identities who they are. It's very it's much more pr prominent in the US data because all the janitors we interviewed, they said we are not just janitors. 
Um, I, am, I like race car driving. Uh, I'm a painter. I'm a photographer. I mean, there is no, there's no such single thing that came in the Indian data. None of them talked about the alternate identities. Here, I'm just doing it as an interim thing. It's not my identity, right? And they're very clear about that. In, in South Korea, it's, it's, it's came up a few times. Um, but it's no data in India, so that's one thing. Second thing in South Korea data we found, religion is very important. They're almost all the people we interviewed are church going. They are very devout Christians. Like three times a day they go to church, some of them are. They get five, five o'clock in the morning, go to the Bible study, come back in the evening, again evening mass. I mean, it's really impressive how the community is important to them. In fact, many people are recruited through the network. That's the network. The church network helps them to find a job. That's really what we found in South Korea. Um, South Korean janitors also talked about different ways of him, uh, how much they know about this field. They told me how each building has a stereotype. For example, um, law school, um, that means they're smoking more cigarettes. <laughs> and they can tell you when the midterms are. They'll tell, oh, there are more, more soju bottles we, 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 we've collected. They're, they're, they're drinking more. So that means they're going through the exam. So they really know almost like what I call the epidemi social epidemiologists of the community. They really have a pulse of it. So there is a space for them to reassert, redefine who they are. I find the Korean data is very fascinating because they're extremely clever in how they manipulate it. Um, US data is okay, but Indian data, there is no such uh, possibility. There is, there is no, um, they don't have a horizon to really think of those possible selves, the way Korean data appeared and, and the US data. Um, I mean, there, there are cultural specific differences. Um, but also, um, the union really fought for a lot of things for them. Each building has a lounge for a janitor in Korean universities, which is unheard of in the US, actually. They cook their own meal every day afternoon. They have lunch together. There is a sense of community among them. And that's really pretty. Sometimes I share the stories with each side. They were very surprised. Oh my god, you can do this. So oh, I wish we could do this. We can't even change my clothes here. Because they have only, only one container. Each ward has a container. That's where they change. They, get, they have to go on a report so in India. So that's really interesting. So um, there are differences, but it's, uh, the, in the US side, it's really horrible. Four o'clock, they come to work. If you're a single mother or anything, most of the time we notice um, they are on the phone around six o'clock. They are what I call the mobile mothering. Have you asked your dad, open the fridge, <laughs> heat the food? I've seen them several times because they really do everything and they're really managing it from here. And that's really, in Korea, it's a regular shift. In India, also a regular shift. They, when I told them this is the shift, they said, who work at that shift? Why are they working? I said, that's the only shift available to them. Only if you're a senior, you can go to the regular shift. So if you're an entry person, it's, it's also the most integrated workforce in, in UFM. It's about 50% non-white, 50% white, more or less. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, on some earlier slides, you, uh, you mentioned some public responses to journalist articles. I was wondering how often caste was mentioned in, like, in the media during the disaster and post-disaster? Occasionally. We were looking for that. Only a few times they mention Ardhadi or the word, Ardhalit. Usually they talk about cleaners or cleaning. A lot of times these people will clean and the politician will take, come and take a picture. So they'll always stand in a clean place. And they, several times they told us, oh, we did it, so they took a picture now. That I did the cleaning. So, so um, the cast has been invisible. Unless the uh, Dalit writer is writing about it, they'll brought the question, caste question into the uh, focus. Otherwise, um, rarely. We also tried to see who the identity is. We tried to see, but a lot of people told us we can't see from the co uh, reader's comment, we can't tell what the caste identity is. They have different avatars and they have different names. So we didn't want any guess on that. Guess that. So yeah, it's very invisible actually. Yeah. And, and they are also, Social media has so many pictures of middle class helping each other. Tons of pictures. If you do a Facebook search or YouTube, stories, stories after stories. But very few uh, have this. Most of them are done by either uh, progressive nonprofit or NGOs or a Dalit activist. Hi, thank you. That was a very, very fascinating presentation. Um, I'm curious, the group that was uh, the state employees, the regular employees, not the contract mm -hmm. employees. What is the caste breakdown there? They're all under the years, 99%, 98%, yeah. 
So was there a sense in which the ones who were working regularly for the state helped the state find the contract workers, or was that something the state did on its own? State really hired contractors. The contractors are all from intermediate caste groups. The contractors were not Dalits, which is interesting finding. Um, um, so, um, yeah, the, the contractors went to each, each city and tell, told them. Basically, they, there are two kinds of contractors. One is you work as a municipal worker in a different district, and you are, you are bust here, right? And there are people who work as a contract company, which hire people. And the contract company has, uh, you know, they have a share, they have a cut, all those things. So it's really, in a way, um, the three different, they're really doing an extra overtime kind of a, you know, the, their sense of how they really see the job when they came here. I assume the oh yeah, there is a huge, yeah, sure, that came. They make a lot of money out of that. They, in fact, the, if I, one of the city people, if I talk, they would say, oh, we already gave everything to the contractor. They didn't distribute it, the gloves or something. That's really the common defense from the, from the bureaucrats, informally when you talk to them. Oh, we did try. We did try. Uh, Ram, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, you've talked about uh, municipal workers uh, with some stability in their jobs, some contract workers who are paid less and less stable mall right. workers. I want to ask you about the relation of this workforce to uh, domestic service. The reason I ask is I have a lot of uh, friends in India who, as they age, are on fixed incomes at a time when wages are rising and they're grumbling about being unable to keep their servants. And I'm wondering, so what might be the relation of those workforces to each other in a period of rising wages and some mobility? Um, they are unionized now. Domestic workers are unionized in the city now. There is a minimum wages you have to give them with benefits, which was not the case before. So that's a good thing. But still, there is a lot of hesitation in hiring a Dalit to work in, because it's, you are coming inside the house. And many times in the interview, they said we had to go back, even the city, which is true in small towns. But city, I was surprised how much uh, the, uh, the, uh, the discrimination exists this, to this level. Um, so the domestic workers are also very clear about what they will clean, they will not clean. They will only clean the utensils and the kitchen and they will not do the cleaning at the toilet or bathroom. That's not part of their job. So they have to have this person to come and clean this. That's, that's, that's how the, the, the greater inequality part you were, you know, you were talking about. That's right. Um, it's, it's a huge issue um, because you're right. The aging population, there's more house, uh, household support is needed and people are hired. And finally, they are, I think only a few months back, they passed the bill. So they have to be paid the minimum wages rules, uh, how many days they get off, things like that. So there was no such thing before. Okay. Hello, hello, Ram, uh, it is Mahesh. Uh, um, actually, I'm from that community, so I know what is the issues are, but uh, Ram, you know, this is our third or fourth generation. This issue is happening from long, long time. Sure. And uh, no one is taking care. Even the, we are not taking care the generation are going to come, they are right. not going to take care, and these th things are going to happen, right. you know, coming, coming, to the, coming to the point. So what is the issue, I mean, what is the root cause of this uh, problem? Is it the cost, or is it the education, or is it the awareness, or is it something else? I mean, I, I didn't see that one, so wh what is the root cause? So we can just hit the root cause. If the cost is the root cause, then we should focus on the cost. If it is the economic factor, I mean, they are not economically empowered. So if the money is the issue, then that is the problem. And again, sir, the answer to your question in the municipality, there is a 100% reservation for those community. So only those people can go. The other, other community, they cannot enter there. And also the answer to the, this gentleman's question, in 1940 or something like that, Dr. Ambedkar asked the, uh, the workers, the sanitation worker, Please go on the strike right, one day right, right. and see how the Mumbai currently is going to work, how to function. Because he mentioned that if the sanitary work 
is go on the strike, the whole university will go to shut down, right? So it happened in 1940, Dr. Ambedkar mentioned the same thing, and whole city was shut down. But then they came to Ambedkar and they asked, what I'm going to eat tomorrow? Because I, if I not work today, I will not get paid, and I don't have you know, things to eat. So again, they start working. So my question, what is the root cause? I mean, it's a complex um, question. Um, I'm, I, I know more about Tamil Nadu. I can talk about Tamil Nadu situation. Um, they're more organized. Uh, the Adi Tamil Pera is very active. Um, so they're all hoping, they're putting all their hope on education. They really think, I don't want my children, next children work on this. That's really the sort of a, uh, emphasis. Um, there are a lot of programs, uh, state programs target uh, for the uh, target these children in terms of uh, scholarships from all those things. But the biggest problem is this. One of the biggest problem because of the discrimination, all kind of other things, men drink a lot heavily. So the lot of men, at least we found many cases uh, in Tamil Nadu, the men uh, average life expectancy is very low for this group, about 55 to 56 which is about 10 years young, uh, younger than the average uh, Tamil uh, male. So what happens is when the men die, uh, because we have the compassion grounds, the compassion ground, the family member can get a job in Tamil Nadu. I don't know about Maharashtra. In Tamil Nadu, you'll get a compassion ground, you'll get a job, family member will get a job. Sometimes the wives get the job, because for the first time they are out of the house. Sometimes the eldest son gets the job because who is not even finishing high school. So it's really an interesting dilemma. If you don't get the job, the family does not have a livelihood is in, in trouble. But the channel who is studying, who can actually, who can actually have a different path. So the, it's a, the groups are people like uh, Adi Tamil Paraway is very conscious about it. They are doing a lot of workshops and things like that. So, so we are trying to get uh, them to come um, to give a talk. I mean, he gave a talk to the uh, um, Periyar Ambedkar meeting about his work, and he gave a talk in Tamil. That's why I didn't invite you. So he talked only in Tamil. Um, yeah, it, it's complicated. The lot of interventions have to do because alcoholism is very high. It's they drink every day, every day they drink. I mean, you can see literally they are dying, which is really. Uh, it's so bad. In the it's the amount of alcohol they drink is unbelievable, actually. Um, education would be very helpful, definitely. Yes, uh, education very helpful, and they are also. I know the thing is, um, then there is uh, the whole professionalization, and we can improve. First thing we have to improve the safety. There is a lot of deaths because of the lack of training, safety equipment. They don't have gloves, proper gloves. All those things have to be given, and there should be more push towards that. And at least uh, many Dalit activists really brought that in their writing during the flood, how uh, impoverished these working conditions are. So I, mean, I think we have to simultaneously work on a few things. One is to how to improve the occupational safety. It, so when I was talking to Japan about this, one person said it's how it was in 1940s in Japan. So what you're going through, and this is exactly what it was. So I don't know, we have to work for another 70 years to go through this, but hope we do something. <laughs> add uh, a comment to this gentleman's question. I think the root cause is uh, caste system. Even though caste system, thousands of years ago, it was devised to make the uh, society work efficiently, but it fall, fell into something which has become a root cause of many, many other things which are keeping the society down. And I come from Punjab, and I, relate to certain things that you have uh, mentioned, but not to that extent. But still, the people there perpetually, they, f they fall into that uh, generation after generation. They just can't get out of it. And I have a recollection, I've been here almost 60 years, but you know, still the things which uh, uh, people can do themselves. And I remember my father helped many people who were in that, uh, those jobs to help their children to go to school. He uh, paid uh, for their tuition and 
a uh, couple of them, I remember that they went to school far away, and they got into jobs, and they uh, got into engineering, and they became uh, workers. And you know, the society has to, I think, respond. But the root cause is still the caste system, because it pull, it don't let them get out of it. They just keep on grinding the same thing and same thing. And they, education definitely will help. And increasing the salary will help too. <laughs> uh, so do you know what is happening in the aftermath of the Kerala floods? Uh, we were trying to, we are, we, we are just in the process of collecting the information. I don't have any. Kerala, at least they were trying, they have a robot and they're trying to robot do the cleaning. <laughs> but I'm not sure how successful that project was. So we are getting information on that. So we have been keeping an eye on that. So we're trying to get the information. Um, and do you also see any difference in how the middle class reacted to the floods? Um, I think the cleaning part is a big problem. Still, the middle class has an aversion to that. The, the, the social imagery of what they really think cleaning is, um, you know, that's really the morale's argument. Your shit is not your problem when you're urban. Urbanist, I mean, you are not thinking about your shit. That's the problem. And I think they are even more because it's really, many of them are migrant workers and it's a very interesting economy that way. Uh, 